Hey everybody and welcome to Into the Terminal. Today we're going to be talking about file system layout and file system devices to some extent. Uh, so Nate, well, well, I'm, indeed. <laughs> yeah, why don't we jump into the terminal and uh, at least get the stage set for our discussion. Sure thing. So it wouldn't be Into the Terminal without a terminal in the critical path, right? We've never done that before. All right, so we're going to talk about file system structure today. And we thought we'd lead off with a very simple, like, what does the file system structure look like on a Linux system? Or I should say a RHEL system, which of course is what this is. So if we do a tree, if you haven't done tree before, this is like just what it sounds like. It shows you a directory tree. If you give it no options at all, it'll show the entire file system, which is way too much for this particular screen. So we're going to tell it dash L1, which tells it only go one level deep, and dash D, which says just show directories. So it doesn't show files too, because normally it shows files. So there you go. Your stage is set, uh, Scott. What would you like to talk about, about the file system now? <laughs> well, I think one of the biggest things, especially for those who are new to Linux, is what goes in these? What are these? Why are they called this thing? Um, so what I'd like to do is maybe flip to uh, my really terrible artworky whiteboard ability. Um, and maybe we just talk about like what goes in these different top level directories. So that when we're looking for something, we know where to look. So uh, get ready for some terrible handwriting folks. Oh yes. Terrible. I cannot express how awful it's going to be. Um, <laughs> also, I know that we typically do the critical path in like five minutes and this one might be a little bit longer than five minutes because we're going to do a little bit of discussion. Um, what? So, I Over know. five minutes, Scott, inconceivable. <laughs> I know. Uh, so I actually happened to have a list of the directories that Nate showed there. So I'm just going to uh, work off of that. And Nate, I figured we would kind of tag team what is in these different things. So maybe sure. our first directory. Home. Home. It goes in home. I like home. Home is home is where the Wi-Fi connects automatically. <laughs> but really, what do we find in home? Home is uh, user home directories. So whenever you create a yeah. user, uh, by default, their home directory is going to live in slide inside of slash home. The only exception to this rule is the super user root. Right, root has his own place or their own place. Yeah. In fact, why don't we just throw that one up here too? Sure thing. Yeah, so slash root, not to be confused with the root of the file system, which is usually what we call slash, the top level. Some people will call that root. Uh -oh. There's also the slash root <laughs> can be confusing sometimes, but that is root's home directory. And this is something that is a little bit different on Linux than it is for other Unixes. So um, on most other Unixes, when you log in as root, you just get the slash directory as your starting point. But what would end up happening is you would download files or like do stuff. And now you had your top level directory kind of filled up with all this random file and directory content. Yep. Um, so in the Linux file system hierarchy standard, they call for the creation of a slash root directory, which is roots home. So when you log in as root, that's where you go. And that way we kind of hide all of roots cruft down here in their own home directory. Um, but the other reason that we do this is uh, when we start talking about accumulating devices together to make a directory structure, it's right. often the case that we'll make a device hold all the user content. Because users yep. do things like download stuff or create files that are too big. Um, and so we want to have some limitations on the amount of space they can consume. It may also be that we need to put in different backup policies. Like there's a whole bunch of stuff that would we could make choices if it was separate, we could make different choices if it was separate. Um, but the root user account, regardless of whether we're able to connect to a device or not, that probably needs to be there. So keeping it as a separate directory, not inside of slash home, is uh, is why we put it out here in a separate directory. So looking looking at your graphic, we have a comment in chat. They don't know who the Voot user is. <laughs> it's how I make ours, people. <laughs> <laughs> These are my my fine school writing skills on display for the entire world to see. Poor old Voot. That's right. 
All right, USR. I put this one here because we just talked about home directories for users, and yet we also have a directory called user. User, yeah, right. Commonly referred to as user. I have seen some people call it slash USR, which doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> uh, and I've heard people call it user. User. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but as USR. as with most things, uh, you know, there's always there's always good uh, arguments about how things are supposed to be pronounced. In, uh, <laughs> in the so, Unix and Linux um, world. Right. So USR is actually an acronym. I okay. Didn't I didn't know that. I'm actually looking at the doc right now to see if I could get you some, some great information about user. <laughs> Oops. That was... Oof. Come on now. Oh, I can't erase it. Dang it. Um, That's resources. I told you my handwriting is terrible. It, my artwork is It looks terrible. like Ro Rose Burn. <laughs> uh, Unix system resources, I huh? My, uh, yeah, I don't know why my... Oh, wait, that might be why. Hold on. There we go. Poor Scott and his fancy tools. I know. Resources. Well, I think I've made it better or worse. I don't know which. Um, but so Unix system resources or USR is where we find applications, libraries. Right. Um, and it turns out we have a couple of other directories too where one might find those. Nate, I know you know the answer to this question. What are those other directories where one might find those at the top level? What, libraries? Maybe. In lib. Or applications? Oh, okay. What about applications right, so, where we find those? Uh, sometimes you can find them in opt. Sometimes you'll find them in var. All depends on what standard you're following and what application you have installed. So we shouldn't find them in var. That would be very disturbing. I was thinking about uh, bin. Oh, right. Okay, right. So executables, yes, would be in bin. I'm talking, I, I thought you meant like application installation directories are sometimes under var. Data might be under oh. var, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, so... In the Linux file yes. system hierarchy standard, it says not only do you need a USR uh, directory, but you also need a slash lib slash, uh, and I'll actually throw this one on here too, slash lib 64, mm -hmm. uh, bin and sbin. And so this has its history in Unix as well. So there right. were two flavors of Unix that kind of developed in parallel. System 5 Unix, which was started by um, AT&T mm -hmm. and Bell Labs. And uh, they ended up giving that code to a university whose graduate students and other people developed it into another Unix flavor called Berkeley Linux. Well, as they're developing these two things in parallel, um, they made different choices. And so in System 5 Unix, they said, ah, we should have a directory where all of our application stuff lives. And so they created USR. And underneath USR is a bin, lib, lib64, and sbin. Um, whereas the folks developing Berkeley Unix were like, oh, let's just make that a top-level directory. So we have slash lib, slash bin, slash sbin, slash lib64. Um, so the Linux file system hierarchy standard kind of blends both together and says, either place is fine. We should mm -hmm. have both to support both styles of packaging and a few other things. Um, but Nate, I wonder if you would do me a favor of toggling on your screen share one more time. Sure thing. And what I want you to notice is that on Red Hat Enterprise Linux, starting at rel 8, bin, lib, lib64, and sbin are all symbolic links that point to their subdirectory and user. 
And so this allows for people who packaged things to go into slash bin, that package still works and unpackages right. correctly on the machine, but it's actual files end up in the USR file system or USR right. structure. Which is better for if you're isolating partitions and whatnot, I would think, right? Because it's a lot easier to, to make, say, say all of user its own partition instead of like, oh, I really wanted bin and lib to be on there as well. Now they're all inside a user makes it a little more collected, organized. All right. So if you flip back, we can, uh, we can talk about what these subdirectories that are also exposed as top level directories are. Um, so Nate, you could tell me what the lib directories are. Lib is libraries. It's simple as that. Shared objects, things like that. And these are libraries that other applications are going to call, right? Shared functions and just basically, how do I get this particular thing done will exist in a library, things that are shared across several applications. Yeah, because like a lot of a lot of applications want to do the same thing, right? Like yeah. print to the terminal. A lot of applications yeah, want like, to print to the terminal. Like TLS and SSL routines, that you don't re-implement those in everything you write. You call open SSL, right? And there's a library for SSL. Right. So instead of putting that functionality and writing it directly into the application, we instead write it one time, and then those applications link to it or use it. So that's what right. goes in lib and lib64. And uh, Nate, what's the difference between lib and lib64? 32-bit uh, versus 64-bit. Because there was a, there was certainly a time, and you may even still see this in the wild, where you may have a 32-bit machine or a 64-bit machine, or compatibility between the two different um, architectures, right? So instead of munging those all into the same library's uh, pile, <laughs> we have them isolated or separated. Right. All right. And then we have uh, bin and sbin. Uh, they get their name because that's where we store binaries. Right, which, yep. which some of us would think about as like commands or utilities, right? There are those executable things that we type at the command line or that we click on that get launched when uh, you know, we're using graphical user interface. But these are the compiled binaries. Yeah, the main thing to remember here is that bin for users is going to be part of your path, your system path. So if you're just anywhere within the file system and type a command that exists in bin, it'll execute it from bin, right? And there's a couple other things that are in that path. Uh, but bin is probably the most common where like commonly used binaries are expected to live. Right. You guys And so uh, the difference are... was with anticipation, watching Scott write out system admin bin <laughs> for S bin, right? So system administrative binaries. And so Nate was right. talking about path, and you can actually like put the search path of what directory should we look in for applications? And for a regular person, you look in bin. But if you're a system administrator, you need to do things like partition disks or change network settings or you know a ton of other things that you would want someone with uh, administrative authority to be able to do that you wouldn't want regular old people to be able to do. And so exactly. we take those things and we put them in SBIN and then we also make sure that SBIN is on our administrative users path environment variable to look in for commands, but is not there for our regular user people to find those executables. So I did a quick, uh, you can see right there, that's the path for this particular machine's root user. If you can read that, user local sbin, user local bin, user sbin, and user bin. Yeah, and I actually think that we've uh, gotten less rigorous about changing that path for unprivileged users. So if you SU'd to the rel user on this machine, um, I bet you would still see some sbin directories show up in there. If I could type a dollar sign. I know she's been hitting all the keys around it. Yeah, yeah, yeah so all the ones close to it. Because there's this big microphone in between my face and the keyboard, so it's hard to see where my hands are. <laughs> uh, so you can see at the end there, we also now add the S bins to regular people. Because it turns out, while we don't want them to necessarily partition disks, um, right. it turns out that the partition partitioning utilities will keep someone without sufficient authority yeah. from doing those activities. 
But that right. person and might want to list the partitions. To be completely honest, putting special or higher, highly elevated uh, uh, binaries in a separate directory that just isn't in your path isn't going to stop people from running them. They just have to call it directly or add it to their path. So, yeah, the, the tool right. has to have its own uh, built-in permission sets or uh, limitations, right? And, and so I bring this up because on Red Hat Enterprise Linux, we now include SBIN on regular people's path. Um, on other Unixes that you may find out there in the world, that's probably right. not the case. Um, and it's kind of a decision that distribution developers make. So you may even find other Linuxes that don't include the SBIN directory on regular user path environment variables by default. Um, but we do here at Red Hat. All right, Nate, you, uh, you mentioned another application directory when we were talking uh, a bit ago. Uh, which one did I talk about, var or opt? Opt. opt. <laughs> yeah, uh, so opt is kind of a weird one. Uh, what's it? It for? is. Uh, some things use it, some things don't. It's not, I don't want to say this like unanimously, but generally on a plain old rail install, opt is present, but there's you're not going to find much in it. But a lot of applications will install inside of opt. And I think it stands for optional, right? Isn't that? Yeah. So yeah. Um, I've seen some way. applications default to installing under opt. And that's just kind of how it is. <laughs> so um, according to the Linux file system hierarchy standard, the user directories, bin, sbin, that stuff is for applications that come with the distro. Right. So if you were a uh, independent software vendor writing software for Linux, you would have your thing installed in opt. And so I know that there's like some enterprise databases that install themselves in opt. There's some uh, middleware services that install themselves in opt. Um, but generally, like if you're a third party person, you would install it in opt according to the file system hierarchy standard. So instead of just calling it optional, how would we also call it? third-party software. Um, but people don't. And here's why. Because opt would have subdirectories like enterprise database, blah, blah, blah. And in there would be a lib and bin and sbin. And right. Java middleware, blah, 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 would have a directory in there. And underneath there would be bin and sbin and lib. And now all of a sudden you have to add those third party locations onto your user's path environment variables so they can find those applications. Right. And so what ends up happening is people don't do that or they don't customize their own environment variable to, to look in those places. And then they call the system administrator and they're like, hey, um, you said that such and such was installed on this machine, but I can't find it or run it. Where did it go? Yeah. Right. Or worse, they open up a support ticket with that company and they go, hey, enterprise database person, I installed the thing, but now it's not there. What, what's the deal? Um, right. And so a lot of software packagers just go, you know, we're just going to put it in bin because everybody will be able to find it. So uh, it's anti the hierarchy standard, but it turns out that people do it anyway. And, and that's OK. Yeah. Just because it's a standard doesn't mean uh, you have to follow it, right? That's right. There are, there are 13 competing standards. Man, I wish we just had one standard. There are now 14 competing standards. So, Ain't that the truth? <laughs> Sorry, right. the dog was getting oh. anxious. I had to let her out. <laughs> I thought you were trying to turn off my internet. Yeah, that's it. Um, if I walk out that door, guys, it kills Scott's internet. We've proven this. <laughs> All right, so another one that we have. That's right, scientifically. It's happened twice. <laughs> All right. VAR. VAR. What is do you know what VAR means, Nate? Like what it uh, should it's variable data, isn't it? Yeah. Or variable VAR. So like a lot of databases will keep their data in there. Um I have seen some libraries get thrown in there, although I don't understand why they end up under VAR, but there's like a VAR lib. Yeah, uh, so that's kind of surprising. 
but maybe it's because uh, they put their, their package, their app, so that it goes under bin and sbin instead of opt. Right. But they don't want to put things in lib, so they put it yeah. in all of it. Maybe that's why. Um, There's also a separate temp like, directory under var temp, which again just is. sometimes leads to extra confusion. Um, but that one's treated, treated differently too. Yeah, it is. It is. We'll talk about temp in a minute, but um, yeah, var temp is, in my opinion, it's been useful for things that are larger because var is generally a separate mount, at least in the standards that I use. And uh, it's usually got more disk space available to it. And it doesn't, well, well, again, we'll talk about temp in a minute, but um, it doesn't have some of the limitations that temp might. Yeah. And so just generally, because it's for variable length data, think about things that you know that you need to store, but you don't necessarily know how big it's going to be. Mm -hmm. right? A great example is log files. Yep. You know they have to go somewhere, but you don't know whether they're going to be big or small or whether some event happens and all of a sudden they become big when they were small. Right. Uh, mail spool, right? Somebody sends a bunch of email, all of a sudden uh, your mail server spool, which lives in bar, is much larger than it was before. Right. Um, but then the mail gets delivered or sent, and now that mail spool is small again. Right. So anything that has unknowable size, that's probably going to be in bar. Uh, other things that we put there, web content goes in var and var www. Yep. Um, what else? Well, you mentioned temp. Um, so var temp is for a longer term temporary storage. So when right. we look at things like cleaning out temporary directories, um, our default cleaning algorithms will look at slash temp and remove stuff every 10 days. Right. Whereas the stuff in That's var what I was going to say about temp. Longer. Yeah. Yeah, after 30 days. Right. Um, so it persists for longer. Um, we also use Vartemp for things like uh, RPM building. That's the default mm -hmm. place where it puts stuff because you might want to work on it for longer than 10 days. Um, other Unixes, they actually clean out temp more frequently, like every reboot or every day. Um, so mm -hmm. if you had to have a longer term temporary storage place, Var was where it would be because you might need some temporary storage. Or a lot of temporary storage, and you couldn't really tell which. Anything so we else? Had a quick, thing? Yeah, we had a quick question in the in the chat. Uh, Shantanu asks, like the general FHS standard file system hierarchy standard, does RHEL have its own standard spec published somewhere? And I think the answer is we generally follow the file system hierarchy standard. Yeah. So we do follow the file system hierarchy standard in terms of all the directories that we expose. We make some choices like the lib, lib64, bin, and sbin symbolic link decision. Right. So it meets the hierarchy standard because the top level directories exist, but we actually make sure that we concentrate those files in another directory. So that's, a, that's something that Red Hat does that you may not find on other distros. Um, the other thing, I, I thought that Shantanu was talking more about like sizing and which one should be on separate uh, devices. For that one, um, Red Hat can't know what you're going to do with the system or what data you're going to store on it. So um, if we just said VAR should always be 10 gig, uh, should well, it be? We do have an administrator's guide inside of the RHEL documentation that gives you advice on how you should partition and some suggested sizes. But you're right, we can't know. We can't know how big VAR should be for your application because your application may need a much, much larger amount of storage than the next application does. Right. And there are also uh, security standards like the DISSYSTIG or CIS mm -hmm. benchmark where they yep. actually explicitly say, this directory should be backed by a different storage device. Right. But again, they don't give you how big that storage device should be because it may be uh, different based on your application or needs. But they right. actually and say some of that is, a, is around mount options and, you know, like turning off execution from temp. That's a thing you have to do if it's a mount, or you can do if it's a mount, but you can't do if it's not a mount, which is another reason why we have these things separated. All right. So. I will wait for Shantanu to, to follow up if he has more questions than that. I think um, Shantanu said that their, their question was about the standard uh, hierarchy, not the sizing, because sizing was too variable. Got it. 
Um, the other thing that you'll see for Red Hat distros in terms of the implementation of the standard, there's another directory that we'll talk about at the very end called slash SRV. Mm -hmm. um, on a RHEL distro, that's pretty much empty. But it's yeah. there because the Linux file system hierarchy standard says it has to be there. So we put it there. Um, other distributions, I think Debian-based distributions, if I remember correctly, they actually put stuff in that directory for services, um, but we don't yeah. do that. We put it in, in var. I put my container data in there, which may not be the right way to do things, but that's the habit I formed. <laughs> so that's where it goes. <laughs> All right, we talked about temp slash TMP. Yep. Uh, that's for temporary content. Um, by default, we clean it out every 10 days. So files that have a last access timestamp older than 10 days ago, it's probably going to be removed automatically thanks to a cron job that we run called tempwatch. Right. Oh, this is one of my favorites. Good old Etsy. Or that's ETC. Right, good old Etsy. Or et cetera. I've heard people call it et cetera. <laughs> so this is another one that that has its uh, history in the parallel Unix distributions of yeah. System 5 and Berkeley. Uh, this is a directory that came from Berkeley Unix. And basically, the people developing Berkeley Unix were like, man, I have this file, but it doesn't belong in bin because it's not binary. <laughs> or var because yep. it's not variable length. Or home because it's not associated with users. So like, what do I do with it? Uh, and so the answer was, we'll create another directory at the top called Etsy for all the extraneous stuff. All right, but that's not how we use it on Linux. Yeah, it's kind of turned Maybe, into what, where all your configuration data goes. Yes. <laughs> so Etsy is very important when you're thinking about backup routines. Yeah. And I'm sure you'll find other things under Etsy too, but primarily it's for things like configuration files. Uh, and it turns out the reason it was created at Berkeley was because like, yeah, we wanted to store configuration files, but it wasn't any of these other kinds of things. So it ended up landing in Etsy, which is how Etsy has now become the place for config files. They, uh, they couldn't just call it slash conf, <laughs> slash config. Well, but is they that didn't know that that's what, it was, that's what it was gonna be then. Right? They just knew that they had these extra files that they needed to store that didn't so, fit in any of their, their categories. So some early on ambiguity has led us to why Why is the configuration directory called et cetera? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Makes perfect sense. Because history. That's some right. decisions made 60 years ago. <laughs> All right. Boot. What goes in boot? My foot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> boot is uh, as you'd expect it's your boot files it's like that's where the kernel lives it's where um, boot configuration lives things like that yeah also your initial ram disk images generated by the Dracula yeah. utility will land in there so these are the things that you need at boot on the machine um, and right. for a long time it was required that this was a separate device and it had to be exist like in a specific spot of the hard drive it had to be under a gig. Remember, it used to be it used to have to be yeah. under a gigabyte because if it expanded too far, it couldn't be read by the bootloader. Right, and so um, a, a lot of those technological limitations have changed over time. Yeah, um, yeah. If you made it a gig but, now, you'd you'd shoot yourself in the foot later. It, well, I mean, if you made it a gig, then you'd also like that, that was just wasting your precious precious disk space. Yeah, um, yeah, but. We still typically will see it separated, um, and it is where uh, compressed kernel images are stored, initial RAM disk images, and then your configuration files for your bootloader, which for us on Red Hat Enterprise Linux is Grub2. Uh, so Grub2's configuration stuff goes in here. And uh, there's also like the second stage executable of Grub and a few other things that you need to boot the machine to get stored there. Um, Gone are the days One of, the of 200 that, megabyte uh, boot boot uh, mounts. <laughs> so I actually ran into a system that had that recently. And the yes. reason I ran into it was because uh, we couldn't apply any additional kernel updates to the machine because there wasn't enough space in boot because there were already two kernels installed on the machine. Yeah. So yep. um, when you're 
overly aggressive with saving space and boot, uh, you may limit yourself to things like how many simultaneous kernels you can have installed at any given time. So, um, fun, this fun is fact, our lab, a, our lab environment doesn't, uh, doesn't have boot separated, but it has boot EFI separated. And boot EFI, of course, is used for UEFI boot kernels or boot uh, environments. Yeah. Fair enough. I just happened to go, All right. and that's only 200 meg. <laughs> Well, but we only ever really use two kernels, so it's fine. Exactly, right. You don't need a lot of space in these because they're just stood up and blown away at the end. But see, this is the kind of stuff where, you know, knowing your workload yeah. tells you how you should size things, right? Me and Nate are like, yep. oh, yeah, we only ever use one or two kernels, so it's fine. Um, but this is a pl also a place, Nate, where that uh, sizing guidance and the system administrator guide may be helpful. Yeah. Yep. All right, All get right. on with this, Scott. We're already, we're already four minutes over. I know. Man, I can, I can uh, hear producer Eric in the back of my head just saying, get on with it, guys. He's, he's crying. Yeah. Um, <laughs> dev. Where goes in Dev? Dev. Dev is a special file system that you don't actually put things in. Things get created there automatically, uh, and that's direct access to devices. So like a serial port, for example, if you had a serial port on your system, you could directly interact with that serial port by accessing dev, TTY, S, whatever, right? And um, in fact, if you switch over to your terminal, um, that's probably dev, PTS. Actually, no, you may be dev, TTY. Um, if you run the TTY command, I think it'll tell you what you're on. Yeah, it's so, PTS zero. So of some text and redirect it to dev, PTS zero, it'll just like blob up on the screen. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's fun on Linux that everything is a device, like the things that you wouldn't expect to be a device. Everything's a file, right? Every device is a file, so you can write directly to things. Like, I could wipe out my hard drive by catting something into Dev SD or uh, sorry, Dev SDA, because it would yeah. just be like, fact, okay, he wants to send data to the drive. Here you go. <laughs> yeah, we were joking around about that on a previous episode, and we were using DD to like direct write to device files. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, yep. all right, so dev. Uh, be, be careful. Uh, is careful with files in dev. Um, we're starting to run out. We're starting to get into like really eccentric ones. Uh, well, it's okay. You're running out of white, whiteboard space, so. I am. It's going to be crazy. <laughs> Sys and proc. Proc, yep. These you know, are these are also are? file systems. So proc is direct access to the processor in some of its features and some of its. Uh... I saw you flinch. Go ahead, correct me. Correct. All right, Pro uh, processes. So I guess is what I'm looking for. Sorry. Yes, processes. processes. The processor is under sys. So yes, every process uh, ID. Really here. Uh, so it's kernel. I know you can't read this. Kernel runtime files. So uh, when you look at either slash proc or slash sys, these are actually files loaded into memory and are managed in memory by your kernel. Um, so when you look at them, you're actually looking at stuff stored in RAM and not just right. any RAM, but the kernel RAM. Um, and so proc, all those numbers there, those correspond to your process IDs. So when you look at PS and the output of the process status command, you're actually seeing the stuff kind of pulled out of the proc directory and shown to you in a more human-friendly format. Um, if we look at, uh, yeah, so like all this stuff is what comes out into the PS command. Um, if you look at... CWD, right, should give me what directory? Oh, sorry. CWD, yeah, I think you just want to do it a long list, a long list yeah. of that thing. Right. Because that'll give you the current working directory of that that uh, process. Sorry. It's proc. 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 <laughs> now I don't feel so bad about my terrible whiteboarding. Off script here, right? Yeah. So CWD says I'm in slash, and that is true. So CWD is current working directory, right? So this is information about this this particular process. Uh, if I were running some other system service or whatever, I could get similar information about about that out of proc. 
Yeah, and then if you look at the top level slash proc again, Nate, uh, and I'm pretty sure we did an end to the terminal episode that talked more about this, um, but things like CPU info, those are the CPUs yeah. that are uh, being used by the kernel. Um, what else? Or interrupts are the IRQs being mapped by the kernel into what things. Um, yep. Mounts are the mounted file systems. Modules are the uh, inserted kernel modules, the KMODs that are loaded into the kernel of this running machine. So all that CMD stuff. Line. CMD line is the kernel arguments that were passed in at boot time. That's also really helpful sometimes to find out what options were specified at boot. I realize you folks are getting some of this cut off because of our cameras, but there. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then the difference between proc and sys is proc is for process stuff and sys is for system stuff. And so system yeah. stuff is like block devices, um, the firmware for different devices. Uh, yeah, the thing oh. the thing I've done most frequently inside of Sys is uh, if you've got a SCSI device that's over fiber channel, you can have your fiber channel HBA rescan its bus by by manipulating some files inside of Sys class SCSI for those controllers, right? So that's really handy stuff to know that it exists. All right. So we're we're nearing the home stretch. There's four more directories to cover. Run mount and media. Yep. All right. So man, run is you can hardly even read that. See now you wish that it looked like a V, you guys. Is it fun? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So run MNT and media are all for like, um, we use them for removable media devices. So at one point we used MNT, that's the place where you just put mount points where you're gonna attach different devices into your directory structure. So currently on RHEL, by default, that's empty. And you as the administrator can make directories underneath there where you wanna attach more devices. Then like a long uh, time ago, the, the standard, oh, maybe you're gonna go into this, right? Um, go, go ahead, finish your statement. <laughs> Okay. Uh, a long time ago, media uh, was used by the desktop environments. So when you plugged in a removable piece of media, like a USB drive or a CD-ROM, that's where it would show up according to the desktop manager. Um, and over the years, that has evolved to instead be run, which is runtime use of devices. So really, I'm just going to generically call these... Um, uh, So the thing I was going to say was mount, it's pretty common if you have removable media that you keep mounted, like, I don't know, USB stick or a CD you keep in this, or DVD you keep in the DVD drive. People throw that under mount. Um, that's not necessarily the right place to do it. You can do it there. Of course, you can you can mount it wherever you want. But there are certain, there are times I've seen install scripts, including our own, assume that mount is essentially disposable, that they can unmount and remount whatever they want on slash mount. Right. So you're going to you're going to want to keep that in mind. If you use slash mount as like a file share, for example, that you have mounted that could get unmounted during an install process that, that, that needs to use mount for something else. So just keep that in mind. Yeah. All right. Last directory. Slash SRV. And I mentioned earlier that we don't use it on Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Right. Uh, but in theory. Standard says service data, I think. Yeah, services. So like uh, if you started up Apache, you mm -hmm. have things like the PID files for Apache. Um, well, we store those in var run, but in theory, yep. we could also put them in SRV. Um, and so that's one that came up later. Um, RHEL already had very established practices where we put these things. And so we just never relocated them to other places. But when you look at other distributions, um, I'm thinking about like Ubuntu, for example, they'll put stuff in SRV for their services. Jonathan asks if mount points nowadays are systemd mount targets. And I think the answer is they can be, but I do not think that most of them are by default yet. Well, like ETCFS um, tab is still very much in use. It's not like these are replaced by systemd units is what I'm getting at. That's what I'm reading into this this question. 
about that. Uh, so the system D unit actually looks at Etsy FS tab and does the mounting. So, um, okay. So I guess the answer is yes, kind of. <laughs> yes, and I think it's more, more, I think where we're going with that is like, if I were to create a device and I want that device mounted at a specific location all the time, you could add it to the Etsy FS tab configuration file, which is historically how we did it. Mm -hmm. So if you're in an environment that has a bunch of different versions of things, or you have administrators who have a bunch of different uh, uh, experience levels, that's probably where you're going to put it, is an Etsy FS tab, because everybody knows to look there for file systems. You could also create a mount unit file um, in systemd and get it mounted that way too. But that would only be really helpful if everybody that you work with knows about systemd and the mount unit type um, and how to use it and how to configure it. Uh, mount unit type is actually pretty handy because if you were actually packaging things up, it's a separate file. So if you were like making that part of your application, you could install that other places because you included it in your application package. So again, it's it's one of those things where like traditionally this is how we do it. And if I was working just kind of standard uh, system administration practices, it's probably how I do it. There are newer ways and there are some benefits to using those newer ways. We want to make sure that everybody that you work with knows the standard which you choose. Right. Uh, because they don't know the standard you choose, they're going to be looking at the FS tab for this thing and they can't find it, but clearly it's a separate device that's always mounted at boot time. What the heck's going on here? How does it mount? Right. It's a mystery. All right. So Nate, that's that's all the file system, the top level directories. Yeah. Um, so we we've, we've talked... We've talked a lot about the file system hierarchy standard. I'm going to throw the URL up on the screen and it'll be in the notes. So if anybody's curious and wants to look through it, that's where you find it. Yep. Um, and then the other thing that we talked about very briefly that maybe we touch on before we close out um, is we mentioned that different devices can back these directories. So how can you look at your machine and see it, what device backs that directory. So you'd get it from DF, right? Or mount, I guess, is probably a more accurate way. Or you could show us, Nate. Yes, I could do that. But I was trying to answer your question first. <laughs> so let's clear the screen here. So mount, I mean, this it used to be this was where you would go to check any mounts. But now there's so many temporary file systems and whatnot that, throw up, that show up in here that uh, DF is usually a lot cleaner place to get the information you care about most. But if you're looking for where did proc come from, for example, right? Or where did dev, where did, where did slash get mounted from, right? What file system is it? What are the mount options? Mount is where you get that information. Yeah. Mount is still the place I think for mount options. Yes. Um, Cause that's not going to show up in, in DF. Sure, but DF is like most of the time what you care about is what do I have mounted? Like what disks do I have mounted and how much space is available on them and things like that. Like commonly that's what a sysadmin is looking for. And that's you you you're, you're going to want to check DF for that. It used to be you'd go to mount first and then if you needed to know space specifically you'd go to DF. For me anyway, that's what I would do. But mount is so full of all these extra devices nowadays that it's 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 hard to parse through what's what unless you just look at DF. Yeah. And so here we can see that um, from our DF output, dev SDB, right, that hard drive is mounted at opt-instruct bootstrap. And so when you put files into opt-instruct bootstrap, they're actually being stored on this very specific hard drive. Right. Um, or if you put things in boot EFI directory, it's going on this very specific partition of dev SDA1. Right. Uh, but what about var on this machine? Where do the files go on that one? Var, uh, because it's not a separate mount, goes into slash. Yeah, what about home? Or root. <laughs> what about home? Same deal. Yeah. If you don't see oh. it listed in here specifically, then it's part of whatever its, it's next, next level up in the directory structure would be. So if, if we're talking about, you know, boot EFI, right? If that weren't its own mount, then it would be inside of boot. If boot was its own mount, if boot was its own mount point, then EFI would be included in boot, 
right, in this particular example. But in this case, since home and var don't have their own mount points, they're just part of slash. Right. And so I think um, while we talked about security standards, talking about the need to have separated devices to back certain types of data, um, I think there's been a general trend in the industry just to be like, oh, we'll make slash. And there's not a lot of gradation of additional directories for specific yes. types of data. Because then we true. don't have to pay attention to things like how big did I make var or how yep. big did I make temp and resizing it, right? If it's all in yep. slash, we know how big it is and then anybody can use that space. But there's a downside too. What's the downside, Nate? Well, the downside is anything could fill up your entire file system, right? A log file that goes crazy or a database that writes a bunch of data or I don't know, memory dumps or something because of a crashing process can easily fill up an, your entire file system. And that can make things nasty, especially if there's something like a database that writes binary data, right? That stuff can get corrupted very easy if your disk gets filled up. And the other downside is for compliance, right? If it's all inside of Slash, then you can't specifically mount or unmount a, a specific directory and you can't change its mount options. So a really common one is temp is supposed to be mounted as non-executable so that an, a bad guy can't write a binary into temp and execute it from temp because temp of course is writable to everybody. That's the whole point of why temp exists. If you can't execute from there, then you know applications can't, uh, can't be run from there. Right. All right. So 50 minutes, Scott. Scott. I know, man. <laughs> Producer Eric is uh, so sad today. Yeah. Yeah, he's going to be mad. <laughs> <laughs> this, is why, this is why he can't leave us to our own devices. Yeah, right? I mean, if he wouldn't have gone and done whatever it is that he's doing today, then he, he'd have been kept, he'd been keeping us on point, and then we, we would have been. <laughs> All right, so any... I tell you uh, what, I was, I was looking at the episode guide for today, and I'm like, man, we're, we don't have a lot of content today. Like always, I've proven wrong. <laughs> so, Nate, any uh, any words of wisdom before we close it out? Uh, well, given the day that it is today and the fact that I live in Pennsylvania Dutch country, I have to say, how much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? Uh, I don't know, but don't groundhogs chuck wood? A groundhog is a woodchuck. <laughs> Fair enough. Poxitone <laughs> Phil. <laughs> All right. It's Groundhog Day for anyone who's uh, outside of the U.S. They're like, what is Nate talking about, about groundhogs? So this is the day that a, a small marmot predicts the weather, usually inaccurately. Because <laughs> he's a marmot and not, not a weather forecaster. <laughs> All right. So... We'll, we'll find out what the forecast was next time. Um, actually, we won't because you won't be with us next time. In two no, weeks, well, we'll find out what the, uh, what the weather forecast Yeah, there's, there's a chance I'll be here. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how next Friday pans out. Um, so next week, we'll be covering the BCC tools. So BCC tools are a super cool administrative utility for showing you real-time performance data on your machine. Uh, so we'll take a look at some of those and, uh, and try them out. Um, and Roll Presents is off next week, if I remember correctly. Uh, but they'll be back at some point and they'll be doing something. Because <laughs> they'll Presents. be back at some point. <laughs> like, like on Nebulous, I was there. They'll be doing something. So they'll be uh, doing something eventually. <laughs> that's right. Uh, I know that we've been talking about things like. Uh, building flat packs and uh, some like workstation, uh, was it pipe wire stuff, things for workstation. I know uh, Bob Davis, who's been a guest on that show before, wanted to do some more REL workstation type content. So that's in the hop. Right. Uh, probably not, Good. not like the next episode, but soon. Eventually. Um, Sometime. Right. So uh, we're, we're continuing with our grab bag of Into the Terminal for the next few weeks as like, Nate is going to an offsite meeting next week. Um, and then we're home for a week. And then Eric is gone for a meeting the week after that. So we're just going to like pick up random episodes and, and go from there. And then I think we're going to start a episode arc 
Mm-hmm. Now we're going to talk about uh, services on Linux. Um, so that that's coming, True. but it's further out than uh, than the next one or two weeks. Yep. Yep. So we're we're going to go a little deeper onto specific services than we have traditionally on this show. You know, like how do I? I don't know. Just as a far flung example, how do I actually set up an Apache web server instead of just like, oh yeah, we DNF installed it in the and the 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 welcome page is there, right? So yeah. Yeah, and I think we also talked about mail server and. Um... Yeah. Yeah, we talked about a few. That was just an example yeah. to give people an idea. So, All right. So we're going to keep rambling if we don't stop it will. here. Scott. Okay. <laughs> stop it. Stop it. Don't forget to mash that like and subscribe button because uh, it's now 54 minutes into our show and clearly you made it this long. So you like us. Tell, tell yes. us with a like. Um, and until next time, happy terminaling. Happy into the terminaling. Yes. All right. Catch you guys in whenever, sometime in the future.